Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for um, coming back promptly. Uh, I'm Martin Myron from uh, Tate Britain. Uh, I'm the um, chair for this final session of today. And I'm very honoured to have been in invited to be um, the chair for this final session for at least three reasons. The first and main reason being we have two really distinguished speakers uh, to round off the day. Um, dealing with uh, uh, large and complex topics. Uh, though there are two papers to look forward to, and I think we'll, we'll really kind of um, spark debate. Um, secondly, because I seem to be the only chair over these two days not to be from one of the organizing institutions for this, so I'm a complete interloper. I don't really belong here. So thank you for that. Oh, is that what it is? Oh, well, yeah, but that doesn't count, does it? Um, and, and thirdly, because um, uh, as one of... Um, one of today's speakers pointed out to me in conversation earlier on, you don't really do landscape, do you? So uh, thanks for that, Steve. <laughs> one, thing I, one thing I have done, though, in, uh, back a few years ago, in 2012, um, I uh, was part of the team that organized a conference at Tate Britain uh, with uh, Joyce Lehman, who is here, and uh, John Timberlake, who I don't think is, um, on landscape and eschatology, which despite having a very difficult... Um, uh, term in the title, rather like this final session, actually, um, certainly opened my eyes to uh, a term within uh, cultural studies, uh, cultural theory, and art practice towards thinking in uh, a rather vast epochal and environmental terms about how to look at images, how to think about images, how to think about theory, how to think about um, artistic uh, uh, practice um, of the landscape. Um, and the Anthropocene, which I've had to have to practice, but um, Anthropocene, I think I've said that right. There may be some variant pronunciations of that term um, during the last part of today. Um, uh, 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 takes us into, into uh, uh, that same territory of thinking about uh, uh, humanity's relationship with the environment, with the landscape, in quite radically different and challenging um, ways. Um, but it also, and it's been touched on a bit during the course of today, um, but it also uh, leads us into... Uh, questions about representability at all, about the question of how uh, the environment, how the global, how the epochal can actually be um, represented. Now, uh, we have uh, an hour before drinks reception, which I see in the agenda. So <laughs> we'll try, as chair, I see it as my, as my duty to try and keep us to, keep us to time, and we'll move um, straight on to the first of our um, papers this afternoon. Um, David Matlis will need very little introduction. Um, you will all um, know his uh, work. He's Professor of Cultural Geography at the University of Nottingham. And you all, I think everybody will know his, uh, his book, uh, Landscape and Englishness, which I see from this was published in 1998, but it's been republished in, in 2016. Uh, the Regional Book, 2015, and In the Nature of Landscapes, Cultural Geography on the Norfolk Broads of 2014. Um, and he is um, talking today on his current uh, research topic, um, the cultural geographies of the Anthropocene um, in relation to, and specifically through the Anthropocenic. So, um, over to you, David. Thank you. Right. Um, can you all hear me? Is, is it working? Yes. So I think I'm going to say Anthropocene. So, you say Anthropocene, I say Anthropocene. Um, so, um, any of you who've read the program will have noticed a change of subtitle. I thought it was worth being slightly kind of grand, as it were, for a subtitle. Um, and, and the subtitle of the paper now reflects the conjunction of the title of the conference, Landscape Now, with an emerging definition of what now might be called, namely the Anthropocene, or the Anthropocene. Uh, by the term Anthropocenic, I suggest the ways in which landscape becomes emblematic of processes marking the Anthropocene. Though it's yet to be formally approved as a new geological epoch, the idea of the Earth entering a time where not only its land surfaces and sea waters, but also its rock records, are irredeemably stamped by human activity, has certainly taken a cultural hold. The Anthropocene may be a label suggesting human culpability or guilt, or human capability and power. The very act of labelling the Earth in this way may be for some an indication of hubris, for others a recognition of blame which might spur remedial action. Not that such action could ever quite remove the label, with everything becoming Holocene again. Even an Anthropocene made less destructive to humanity would remain an Anthropocene, the remedial action signifying the human capacity to affect the Earth. So landscape now could be rephrased as Anthropocene landscape, 
At least that label could help shape the ways in which landscape is figured in future decades and in future centuries and so on until landscape commentary shrivels or drowns or shivers in whatever climate and weather is in store for us. Just as the Anthropocene is, like any other geological terminology, a piece of wordplay, and one that's stuck precisely for its provocative conjunction of the human and geological, so the Anthropocenic, I suggest, might offer a term through which landscape, in all its cultural complexity, could help us figure this supposedly coming epoch. Now, I first floated this term in a scientific journal uh, called Nature Climate Change, which some of you may occasionally look at, um, it was an attempt to carry some humanity's reflection into scientific discourse. And what's notable, I think, is that Anthropocene debates have been marked not only by cultural practitioners using the languages of science, but by scientists being ready to engage with cultural discourse. And indeed, scientists recognising their own narratives as narratives with cultural and political import. And here what I want to do is try and demonstrate how the Anthropocenic might play out around one landscape, which, because of the sea level rise associated with climate change has become emblematic of Anthropocene process, namely the coast. I'm going to focus on English material and I'll consider some recent art practice and the wider visual cultures of coastal process. I'll also consider the ways in which past landscape images and indeed images of past landscape may speak to the Anthropocenic present. There's quite a complex temporality around the Anthropocene and I think it's worth just saying something about that as a, as a sort of prelude to what I'm going to say later. So one of the distinctive things about the Anthropocene is its treatment of time. Some of you will have read lots of stuff about this, some of you may not have read anything about this. So I'll just note a few key traits here about at the Anthropocene and time. Firstly, this designation is unlike any other geological epoch, prospective as well as retrospective. And that makes a difference, I think. Secondly, while geologists are seeking what they call a golden spike in the sediment record to mark the stratigraphic beginning of the epoch, and the current favourite is post-1945 because of the global traces of atmospheric nuclear weapons testing, um, the drive to a precise date sits alongside the fact that the processes making the Anthropocene were quite evidently set in train long before this. Um, a third point to make is that commentators have argued for a wide range of start dates for the Anthropocene, and this is likely to remain a matter of scientific contention. Some arguments have it starting around 1800, some have it starting in the 16th century, some push it back to prehistory. The fourth point is that you can also trace a history of commentary on the human geological presence which prefigures and anticipates current discussion. And that itself goes well back beyond any potential golden spike in the sediment record. So the Anthropocenic finds itself concerned with what Caitlin de Silvey has termed anticipatory history. And we might find, therefore, that landscape now and landscape then start to converse. Hence, this presentation will move across images going back to the mid-19th century, as well as talking about some contemporary material. So the rest of the presentation is going to offer a kind of Anthropocenic story through a series of images. And we begin in this image... Um, we, had to, we were told to put a credit on all of all these photographs, so I've stuck my name on the bottom of uh, this one, just for copyright reasons. Um, so we'll begin here with this image, which is on soft cliffs, looking out to sea at East Runton on the north coast of Norfolk. It's just along from the resort of Cromer, if it's going to appear again. Have I stood on a wire here? There it is, it's come back. Um, it's from a site called uh, the appropriately named Sea View Caravan Park. I hope the one at the other side is going to appear um, again in a moment. Um, the Sea View Car Park, Caravan Park, and we're going to return to this site at the end. I've written about this view in a forthcoming book edited by Tim D, which is called Groundwork, which is a collection of sort of nature cultural commentary, which is coming out next year. Now, the view from such cliffs is now, of course, overlain by narratives of climate change. Not least as out to sea, there is a large wind farm. You can't see it on this image, but um, that farm seeks to mitigate climate change at the same time as storm tides eat into the soft coastal sediment. So the English seascape starts to alter here. Not the sea views are the only scenes carrying such freight. Simon Roberts' 2014 photograph of floods in the Somerset Levels here, which features in his new book Merry Albion, uh, can also become an Anthropocenic image of future Anthropocene sediment being laid down in extreme flood events, brown, silty waters covering the Somerset fields. Robert's book as a whole prospects the country, and at Borough Mump, 
Here he finds others taking a prospect view, recording images whose projected future frequency has become a trope of landscape commentary. Coastal change has been a subject for the painter Julian Perry, who in 2010 exhibited uh, a collection called An Extraordinary Prospect, the Coastal Erosion Paintings. This is the cover of the book, the catalogue. Works in oil showing Norfolk, Suffolk and East Yorkshire coastal scenes. This catalogue cover shows, uh, the title is Fanfare 34. Fanfare is the model of caravan shown. But it also perhaps suggests a soundtrack for the humble caravan's dramatic entry into the frame of art. Uh, these paintings do not in any sense look down on their objects. They gain elevated status as the ground is pulled from under them. Perry lets human dwellings, bungalows as well as caravans, hover in mid-air. They're still grounded on grass and topsoil. Oil paint allows these ordinary objects to retain their substance as they contemplate and make for an extraordinary prospect. Paintings such as this one, Caravan Holiday, uh, make, I think, exemplary Anthropocenes. East Anglian coasts have become prominent in cultural engagements with climate change, in part through local artistic and literary networks. Also from proximity to public and commercial institutions in London and the not unrelated gentrification of coastal areas <coughs> through second home ownership, notably in Suffolk and North Norfolk. So we find here also that the interpretation of processes defined as global can be inflected by local social geographies, which themselves shape the geographies of creativity. Artworks other than Perry's have tracked erosion, as in 2005 at Bordsey in Suffolk, where Dutch artist Bettina Fernay uh, produced lines of defence, placing flags in lines stretching back from the cliff edge, spelling out, as you can probably read, submission is advancing at a frightful speed, and their subsequent disappearance between January and September that year marked the invading force of the sea. And there's a 30-minute time-lapse film, which you can watch online, which records their toppling, the message being lost at the very moment that it's confirmed. Now, the coastal analytic enfolding of human and natural has a very long history. Historical inquiry shows a long genealogy of the kind of sea-level melancholy often associated with this work. And that itself, I think, becomes part of the anticipatory history of the Anthropocene. Thus, in 1902, journalist Beckles Wilson wrote a book called The Story of Lost England, from which this image comes from. It indicates how erosion then as now gets caught in national narrative nets. In Wilson's case, those are threatened island nationhood. Lost landscapes, in this case, just as today, become landscapes for now. This is a, a chart of lost Sussex at Selsey Bill, and I'll just read you the description that Wilson provides alongside this. He says, perhaps no point off the coast of Sussex presents such interest to the student of lost England as the waste of waters immediately fronting Selsey Bill. Standing on the verge of that promontory, the visitor today, gate directing his face seaward, may, if he chooses, conjecture that in the ruffled expanse of breakers, exactly one mile distant from where he stands, was founded the first monastery in Sussex. Landward from the Saxon Cathedral and Episcopal Palace stretched a great wood known as Selsey Park, containing many thousands of acres. Here, truly, is a choice and memorable fragment of lost England. So undersea worlds here are described as if they're preserved in aspic lending enchantment and value to the whole. Under the North Sea lies an area which has increasingly been termed Doggerland. And the recent upsurge in commentary on Doggerland is very striking here, and I think there's a clear echo of the material that was talked about before the break here. Um, this is a very ancient place, but it's very clearly a landscape for now. In a period preoccupied with sea level and with the British relationship to Europe, uh, a prehistory starts to chime with the present, although it chimes to varying effect. Doggerland, the connecting land between Britain and Europe uh, in ancient times, could be a sign of British connection, or it could raise questions of insularity. It could be a warning of how lands have been lost before, and they might be again if we don't take care. Or it might be a naturalisation of change, confirming that seas have always risen and fallen, and maps will thereby shift. The name Doggerland was coined by an archaeologist called Bryony Coles in 1998 in tribute to a geologist called Clement Reed, from whose book Submerged Forests in 1913 this map comes. Reed wrote a chapter on the Dogger Bank, which is in the middle of the North Sea, uh, and this map shows, shows the approximate coastline at the period of the lowest submerged forest, as the caption says. So the North Sea here becomes former land. A quick shading in of Reed's outline would completely reconfigure the geography of Britain and Europe. 
And in 1906, Reed wrote some very prescient commentary about sea level change. And I'll just read it to you. This was in the Geographical Journal. If what I have said is correct, and since civilised man lived in Britain, there has been a rapid change of sea level, followed by a long rest, what are the prospects of a similar period of rapid change again setting in? It is a problem of great importance, for a new rise or fall of the sea level to the extent of a few feet would have most disastrous effects on all our coasts and harbours, and would seriously interfere with our inland drainage. Are we now living in a period of exceptional stability, both of sea level and climate, or is it, as geology suggests, a mere interlude? which may at any time give place to rapid change. That was in 1906. In 1998, Bryony Coles wrote her archaeological paper on Doggerland, which contained these maps. She tried to shift the narrative from ideas about the land bridge between Britain and Europe to imagining Doggerland as a place in its own right. And these maps trace submergence and familiar shapes begin to emerge from left to right. They're maps of exactly the same area, the point being. So the one at the left, or the second one from the left, is from 13,000 years ago. So the North Sea is a little inlet appearing. Uh, the middle one, uh, sorry, the, um, the second one from the right, uh, is from 10,000 years ago, I think. Something like Scotland emerges. Uh, and at 5,000 years before the present, we see Britain and Denmark with the Dogger Hills left as an island. Cole's 1998 paper provides a departure point for artist Stefan Takeda's website, Reclaiming Doggerland, uh, which he says is an attempt to remap Europe and claim back the lost territories of the North Sea. It's an intriguing website, and blog posts report photographic excursions around the North Sea, including here in East Norfolk uh, from Haysborough, Adventures in Doggerland, Day 4, 30th of May, 2012. And I'll just read you the bottom uh, quote here. Uh, it says, on the edge by the car park stood a shack, or at least a sort of holiday chalet in which people were living, apparently holding on until the ground literally disappeared beneath their feet. They were flying across of St. George. This could have been for a number of reasons, football, patriotism, nationalism, but it occurred to me that the claiming of this land as England seemed so pointless. Presumably it would not be long before this would cease to be England, or in fact anywhere. As this commentary suggests, the prevailing tone of Doggerland discussion in England and elsewhere is counter-nationalist, highlighting what archaeologists Gaffney, Fitch and Smith label as Europe's lost world off the East English coast. They write, Doggerland may well have had a significantly different character in comparison with Britain and possibly all the surrounding countries. But you could, of course, take other narrative turns. Doggerland could be taken as marking remaining eastern areas as distinctive within England part of a former lowland territory now lost. Why look out to sea for Doggerland? Look underfoot instead. And there's been lots of rather interesting commentary in recent years about the east coast of England, particularly around things like the Brexit vote and so on. And you know, there are kind of interesting things going on with these evocations of ancient landscape. Now, if older geological researchers appear newly resonant, as I think these things show, Earlier paintings might also turn anticipatory for the present. Uh, the edging of land and sea has offered a territory for complex symbolic and emotional play, as in the work of Paul Nash, who we've already heard about today, notably his paintings of Dimchurch. Uh, and Nash's depictions of coastal defence might gain another resonance simply, or perhaps not so simply, as Anthropocene's in advance. Nash's 1922 Wall Against the Sea, which was exhibited at the Carnegie International Exhibition in Pittsburgh in 1923, remained in America thereafter, but was shown in the recent Tate um, uh, show. Uh, this takes a more elevated position than many of his coastal images. It offers a picture of engineering control. I think as with other Nash subjects, such as war or prehistory, it would be rewarding to plug the dim church images into wider contemporary cultures of landscape concerning sea defence, just as the paper this morning did that for geological science. Uh, and you might find a meeting of personal and political preoccupations with control and anxiety and the capacities of the human. The work of Nash's brother John returns us to East Anglia with this painting uh, titled in Ian Collins' study of East Anglian art, Norfolk Coast, Waxham to Winterton. And it's dated as 1932 in that book. This is a dune coast backed by the low-lying Norfolk Broadland, and there's no elevation in land to stop the sea for miles should it break through. And the sea had broken through here on a number of occasions, and it would do so again to catastrophic effect in 1938. So Nash is here picturing the levels of land and sea. The dunes are a brief interruption on a single plane 
and they are very vulnerable to storm surge. Further up the coast, in Norfolk from Waxham, is a place called Eccles. And at Eccles, a church tower stood on the beach in the 19th century. It fell in a storm in 1895. I've recently become rather obsessed with this tower and am writing up a whole paper on it, which is expanding. It's amazing what you find about a ta one tower. Um, Eccles became famous scientifically in Charles Lyell's hugely influential book, Principles of Geology, which was first published in the 1830s. These images come from the 1866 edition, uh, where Lyell included two engravings of Eccles Tower from 1839 on the left, where it's buried under encroaching sand dunes, uh, and 1862 on the right, where the sand dunes have moved inland and have been washed away, and the tower stands on its own in isolation on the beach. Eccles became an iconic site for Lyle, and I think could well be an anticipatory emblematic site for the Anthropocene. And Lyle's work remains an anticipatory reference point for geological discussions of Earth and humanity. A lot of the scientific literature about the Anthropocene traces these ideas back to Lyle. And in Principles of Geology, Lyle stated, the Earth's crust must be remodeled more than once before all the memorials of man, which are continually becoming entombed in the rocks now forming, will be destroyed. So that's basically a prediction uh, in 18, well, in the 1830s uh, of the human marking of the rock record. To conclude, we'll move back up the Norfolk coast a little further. So this is another kind of local study, I suppose, to go back to the local theme from earlier on. But it's a local study which I think makes bigger points. Um, we return again to the caravan site at East Runton where... Um, I started. Um, reflections on landscape now, I think, uh, can emerge not only from academic reading and art historical analysis, but from everyday field work and from spending holidays in a caravan on the top of soft cliffs, cliffs from which fossils indeed regularly emerge as emo erosion proceeds. This makes the Anthropocenic very vivid. Um, the diurnal rhythms of a seaside holiday where tide times can be checked to shape beach plans until last year on these wonderful tide clocks provided uh, at the top of the slipway at East Runton. These have now disappeared, which may or may not be symbolic of change. Um, these diurnal rhythms are supplemented by other temporalities. Sea views turn to other prospects. How long will this caravan be here? Does that roaring, breezy summer night sound of the sea signal danger? Not that such questions weren't asked 40 years ago or 100 years ago, but the prevalent narrative of climate change and sea level rise and the designation of a new Anthropocene geological epoch makes the question of landscape now somehow different. And it seems to make landscape somehow become dark <laughs> <laughs> and um, bright again and, um, and Anthropocenic. So, thank you. We're, we're following the format of um, earlier parts of today, and we will move straight on to our second speaker, um, Mark Cheatham, who is Professor of Art History um, at the University of Toronto, a Guggenheim Fellow, um, and Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, um, who published in 2012, Art Writing, Nation and Cosmopolitanism in Britain, The Englishness of English Art Theory since the 18th century, and um, even more pertinently, um, a new book uh, due out with Penn State early next year, Landscape into Eco-Art, Articulations of Nature Since the 60s. Mark. Thanks very much. And um, having the honor of speaking last today, uh, although I know you're all anticipating the reception afterwards, but the honor of speaking last, I want to thank uh, the conveners and the organizers, again, most sincerely, it's, it's been a great day uh, so far, and I'll try not to um, disrupt that uh, too much. I want to ask, what are the implications of comparing landscape practices over several centuries? It's a risky undertaking. There are many reasons for instead making distinctions between the landscape tradition in Britain from the 17th century forward experiments in land and earth art in the 1960s and 70s, and what is now widely referred to as ecological or eco-art. In their catalog to the exhibit Uncommon Ground, 
land art in Britain, 1966 to 79, in 2013, Nicholas Elfrey and Joyce Lehman, both of whom are here, are certainly right to warn against, quote, questionable assumptions about the continuity and adaptability of a British landscape tradition. I suggest, however, that both differences and plausible connections in this extensive artistic engagement with the earth need to be considered if we are to realize a full understanding of contemporary ecological art on the one hand, and perhaps of landscape now and landscape then on the other. Instead of following the habitual art historical periods then, my plan is to adapt aspects of the notion of the Anthropocene as our frame for comparison, which has been done before, which is good to see. If you can follow, if you can allow for the moment that there are distinctive but also interrelated practices uh, between what we call landscape, uh, land art, and eco art, it follows that these aesthetic representations and presentations at the very least coincide temporally with some descriptions of the Anthropocene. This is the, um, as we've just heard, this is a term that describes our time, both past and prospective, in which human activity has become a force of nature. Landscape as a genre and a practice is also coincident with several of the competing descriptors uh, for the Anthropocene. For example, the Capitolocene, which is Jason Moore's term, or the Thulocene, already mentioned, Donna Haraway's terms, uh, term, the latter of which underscores the main cause of global warming, industrialization. We might well add UC Parika's memorable neologism, the anthroobscene, which stresses, he's serious about this, which stresses the indecency of the wanton disregard for and humiliation of the integrity of the earth, of humans, of non-human animals, and of other organisms and inanimate materials. One uh, often cited starting point for the Anthropocene is the Industrial Revolution in Britain. Whatever our speculations and our decisions, scientific and humanistic, about the beginnings of this period, uh, many scientists and lay observers believe that we are currently creatures of this epoch. When, and especially how it will end for humans and the planet are increasingly urgent questions. Thus, without suggesting a progression from landscape to land art to today's eco-art, I think it's useful to note that all are phenomena of the Anthropocene. That alone justifies their comparison, I think. But before I proceed with this argument, I want to enter another caveat, powerfully stated by Zoe Todd, that you've been looking at the quotation on screen by. She says, as a Métis scholar, I have an inherent distrust of this term, the Anthropocene, since terms and theories can act as gentrifiers in their own right, and I frequently have to force myself to engage in good faith with it as heuristic. While it may seem ridiculous to distrust a word, it is precisely because the term has colonized and infiltrated many intellectual contexts throughout the academy at the moment that I view it with caution. I ask myself, and I think we should um, keep these questions in mind, what other story should be told here? What other language is not being heard? Whose space is this and who is not here? Keeping Todd's warnings about the Anthropocene in mind then, my proposal is that landscape as a practice is very much of the Anthropocene and that landscape does find its way into contemporary eco-art. Putting it this way has another danger. It indulges in what I'd call spirit photography by summoning a ghost, or perhaps the elephant in the room, uh, Kenneth Clark's frequently cited and frequently criticized Landscape into Art, which was published originally in 1949. Just when land art was becoming established in the mid-1970s, Clark's second edition of 1976 reiterated his pessimism about the future of landscape as a genre. In accidental company, then, with land artists themselves, Clark excavated something of a ha-ha between then contemporary practices and earlier landscape depiction. One objection to Clark's account 
is that he plots a linear progression through which landscape elements, once simply decorative or stage setting supplements in religious and historical paintings, achieve independent status in the 19th century as so-called pure landscapes. Accounts of landscape as a category since Clark's time, I think unfortunately, often also suggest, sometimes not very explicitly, that landscape, land art, and then eco-art also follow chronologically, dialectically, and in some accounts almost teleologically, one from the other. They also largely agree, and here again I would differ, as Clark predicted, that landscape is over. My counterclaim is that these inflections of the earth actually coexist, both in the recent past and certainly now. I'm not going to rehearse the litany of territorial critiques of the landscape genre by land artists or recount contemporary eco-artists' various complaints about both landscape and land art. Instead, let's see what an emphasis on analogies among these practices might yield. Pioneering land artist Nancy Holt recalled in 2013 that it was during a visit to England in 1969 that her interests in landscape depiction and theory solidified. Ditto for those of her husband, Robert Smithson. It was in England that the roots of that kind of thinking began, she said. I always think of Gilpin, we were going back in terms of our roots, our ancestral roots, and also finding out how the English treated their landscape, how the natural, having it fit into the existing landscape, transformed the formal garden. Whether or not we can accurately recruit Gilpin's theories as a progenitor, Holt was an innovator in emphasizing land art's relationship to the human body and human reality a stance also adopted by others at the time and since, including British artist Chris Drury. Drury him describes himself as an environmental artist working at the interface of art and science to make what he calls site-specific nature-based sculpture. He also calls himself a land artist and frequently refers to landscape. His extensive portfolio is instructive regarding ongoing relationships between eco-artists and the previous generation, not least because his practice began with notice, noted land artist Hamish Fulton in the 70s. Sympathetic with Fulton and with Richard Long's principle to, quote, take only photographs and leave only footprints in the landscape, Drury also acknowledges his debt to remotely sighted American land art, which was at the time often criticized in Britain and elsewhere. Sorry? Oh, yes, getting there. It's fine, fine. Interjections, welcome. <laughs> it was time. That one was starting to burn. You know, so we didn't want that. Thanks very much. Um, the camera obscura for him uh, is one ideal tool with which to explore landscape to bring nature inside a human structure and to enact the confluence of inside and outside that we might think of as a principle of ecological interconnectedness. Jury has then, since the 90s, been constructing what he calls cloud chambers, uh, huts that act as camera obscura is usually sited in the moral surroundings. Wave chamber of 1994 that you see on the screen at the moment uh, was built beside a reservoir in uh, Kilder Water and Forest Park, Northumberland. The rock structure and its aperture are designed to transmit the sense of water to the interior. Drury notes that, quote, the rippling surface of the water is projected onto the pale floor of the chamber, which echoes to the sound of waves. Much, I think, as in Alexander Pope's subterranean refuge at his garden in Twickenham, and indeed in many examples of contemporary ecological art, both vision and sound are important or indeed essential to the effect. Pope's cavern uh, was unusual as a camera obscura in that it was underground. Drury, and, oh, and I've got an, the diagrams here. Um, Drury has also created two works that share this underground feature. 
the Tarberger Cloud Chamber in 1994 and Cloud Chamber for Trees and Sky in 2003, juries captured moving images are very much uh, of the earth, moving in the sense of animated. A typical example is Sky Mountain Chamber of 2010, made from 150 tons of local limestone and sited in the Trento area of Italy. An aperture in the side of the camera obscura causes the peaks of these mountains to be projected upside down onto the wall of the interior. Uh, the philosopher of science, uh, Michel Serre, no relation, I don't think, to the Serre we've seen before, but that would be intriguing if he was related. Uh, his 1990 book, The Natural Contract, gives one perspective on the inside-outside paradigm that I'm drawing attention to. Serre's book was presci uh, prescient, uh, earth-centered anticipation and analysis of the theories of the Anthropocene before they'd been articulated, and remains a profound indictment of what our technological culture has created. Serre holds that we are combatants in what he calls a world war that takes the material earth and all its inhabitants as a target of multiple hostilities, in part because Western technological society is obsessed with data and with words. We busy ourselves only with our own networks, he claims, to the extent that we have forgotten nature because, he continues, the essentials of our lives take place indoors and in words, never again outdoors with things. But here we need to pause, perhaps, recalling the camera obscura's talent for bringing the outside in and productively complicating any lines we might draw between nature and culture. Sarah reiterates a commonplace that sets nature outside against culture inside. His broader insights can be updated by looking at how eco-artists today work expressly across, instead of defining this borderline, uh, between the museum as physically and socially inside and nature as somehow beyond these limits. To offer ready paradigms in these terms then, if eco-art articulates such a borderline, Land art, by contrast, wanted out of the museum and the city, at least in theory. Even Robert Smithson's famous non-site site dialectic denied art institutions their former authority, while also making the notion of a simple outside or inside impossible. Conveying nature into the museum today is arguably a peculiar symptom of Western society's apparent alienation from the non-human environment. Powerful examples might include um, Olafur Eliasson's Tate Turbine Hall exhibit, The Weather Project in 2003, which not only recreated an atmosphere inside, but also displaced and disseminated discourses about weather throughout the city via posters in taxi cabs that you can see on the right-hand side here. And also, in this regard, uh, the French artist Pierre Wiegs Untilled, seen at Documenta 13 in 2012, which was a bee-filled garden replete with a homage to Joseph Beuys in the, set in the composting area of the Documenta site. There have also been a large number, of course, of eco-art exhibitions demonstrating the angst of the Anthropocene, or more hopefully, a widespread will to grapple with it in the aesthetic. I used to think that this move indoors for landscape or land art or eco-art was somehow unusual, but that view depends too much, I think, now, uh, on older paradigms of land art as defined by being cited remotely. If we think in terms of a longer history, presenting nature indoors has been the norm in the West as long as, long before landscape be became a separate genre. More floating uh, topics. Um, Simon Starling's Island for Weeds and One Ton Two, that I will get to in a moment, focused purposefully on border crossing to make ecological statements. <coughs> A self-reflexive meta-work, the floating garden that is Island for Weeds that you see here, 
as well as its predecessor that we've already talked about a bit today, animated the 18th century importation to Scotland of rhododendrons, as well as the plant's subsequent takeover of local flora and thus their recategorization as weeds. Mirroring the plant's original migration from Spain, Starling's Island transported them to the Venice Biennale where he represented Scotland in 2003. There are, of course, analogies to be made with Smithson's Floating Island, uh, re uh, realized posthumously in 2005, as we've heard, and perhaps more significantly with the long-standing impact of species migration thanks to human exploration, we've also heard about today. Uh, the naturalist Joseph Banks, for example, who accompanied James Cook to the South Seas in 1768 to 71, sought to improve the lot of indigenous peoples by giving them domesticated animals uh, that he imported. The ecological impact, of course, we now know in retrospect, was horrendous. With happier overtones, perhaps, Starling's Island raises issues of indigeneity, immigration, and hybridity that are directly analogous to the concerns of contemporary societies. Starling's One Ton Two engages such concerns in a more material and less overtly art historical manner. The title refers to the amount of ore that must be extracted and refined to produce the platinum used in, five, in the five images displayed. Photographs that themselves simply show the open pit mine in Africa that is the source of the platinum. Both telluric and national boundaries are crossed in the making of this and any image, any photograph, an ecology that is absurdly expensive in terms of the planet's resources and that Starling makes visible. What is the cost to the Earth in material and human terms? Starling poses a similar question uh, in a piece called Inventar number 8573, Man Ray, a sequential slide projection in which we come closer and closer to a Man Ray photograph until we can see uh, what UC Parika calls the geology of its medium, the silver particles that make up the photograph. Starling's approach to eco-art then is specifically contextual and also material in this way. Let me conclude, although this conclusion takes a while, uh, just to warn you, uh, by proposing another linkage of landscapes uh, across supposed barriers of time and genre. Now with works that examine the commons in the agrarian past and the digital present. The Irish artist John Gerard calls his hypno hypnotically artificial virtual reality simulations of buildings portraits but they're certainly in landscape uh, format, as you see here, and engage with issues of land use. They show how land comes in to ecological art. Given that they exist only as files to be projected in a gallery, which is where I saw them, or viewed on a computer screen, chances are that we will experience them in landscape format too, and most probably indoors. Two of Gerard's works make oblique reference to paradigmatic land arts interventions into the agricultural system, uh, specifically those of Dennis Oppenheim, Cancelled Crop, 1969, and Agnes Dene's Wheatfield, an intervention uh, from 1982. Both Sow Farm near Libby, Oklahoma, and Farm, Prior Creek, Oklahoma, to overgeneralize, strategically, graphically show what art does now in the vast spaces of the United States after land art heroically claimed the West. Fascinated by what takes place in the Oklahoma landscape, Gerard returned to produce the image that you see on the screen now, the running farm, Prior Creek, Oklahoma, in which he went to great lengths that I'll describe in a moment to picture one of Google's data farms. While he does not announce a political program in the way, say, Dennis or Oppenheim did, it is apparent that reflection on mass consumption, industrialization, and digital surveillance informs uh, these simulations. Gerard states, quite generally, to me the landscape dotted with farms and oil feeds, fields in this region also represents the global trend of unrestrained mass consumption. 
farm shows similarly monolithic and characterless buildings from the outside. This time, however, the crop is data, a resource extracted, cultivated, stored, analyzed, and certainly protected in a Google server farm that you see here. Accustomed to harvesting images from Google's various sites at will, as I suspect we all are, uh, Gerard wanted to visualize the hardware too, the source. But because Google would not allow him to access any images of this site, he hired a helicopter and a photographer to take 2,500 photographs of the site that were in turn rendered into the simulation that you see. Ephemeral in the extreme, the internet is at once pervasive and invisible, and that's what he wanted to get around, the invisibility. Girard here brings it down to earth by showing us its materiality, how demanding this network is on earthly resources. You see the cooling systems, for example, and therefore how, it, how entwined it has to be with other social and economic systems. Just as the term farm describes a new form of husbandry, so too the term landscape here is repurposed. Uh, the website Yahoo Answers, which I've only visited once, I want you to know, just for this quotation, uh, provides a good example. They say, the result of data farming is a landscape of output that can be analyzed for trends, anomalies, and insights in multiple parameter dimensions. Farm is too commonplace in what it shows to be thought of as sublime or picturesque. It's left that landscape discourse behind. The tedium of the buildings is uh, more likely, perhaps, to lead to the experience of bathos, that bottoming out or sense of baseness that is thought to be the antithesis of the sublime. As theorized by Alexander Pope in Peri Bathos of 1727, it suggests a fall from ideals, a degeneration, but also a profundity. Perhaps what we see in Girard's animation here is the bathos of the ideals of a digital commons. Historically, of course, the commons referred to shared land. Today, we hear references to the digital commons and the digital landscape without always making the connection to the privatization of data and communications that Girard alludes to in reproducing the data farm that you see. Calling this work a postmodern pastoral, Girard claims that he wants the urban London public to be more aware of these sites, as it is here in the city, that we consume their work. In Farm, going on with the quotation, there is a more ambiguous sense, as it is not clear if we consume the products of this farm or are ourselves consumed. In picturing both the infrastructure and the fate of the digital commons, Farm stands in contrast but, and this is my claim, in fruitful conversation with uh, an image such as Cornard Wood, uh, Gainsborough's nostalgic portrayal of what remained of the agricultural commons in mid-18th century rural Suffolk. As Ian Waits explains, parliamentary legislation uh, that forced, quote, the enclosure of operable fields by private interests was largely completed before 1700 that many areas of woodland waste, as shown here, remained in common well into the 18th century. Local commons prerogatives are on display in this painting. People contentedly gather wood, graze animals, take a drink from a stream, etc. The economy of this uh, landscape is evident too. We may imagine a narrative uh, uh, progression in which laborers take what they have foraged home or perhaps to market in the town seen in the distance. Harmony among peasants, animals, and the land seems to prevail. Even in the large, dark, empty, swampy area to the right, which might be a pond, um, hides no sublime threat, no lurking banditi, which you might imagine if Salvatore Rosa had painted this a century before. The concord presented by Gainsborough, then, is that of a thriving, pre-Anthropocene economy, one soon to be erased. Without suggesting that Gainsborough, let alone Girard, had Pope in mind, 
The following passage from Perry Bezos, in which he describes his contemporary stacking of ancient texts, has, I think, contemporary resonance. And I'm quoting Pope now. Though it is evident that we never made the least attempt or inroad into their territories, but lived contented in our native fens, they have often not only committed petty larcenies upon our borders, but driven the country and carried off at once whole cartloads of our manufacturer to reclaim some of which stolen goods is part of the desire of this treatise. Farm is superficially anodyne, yet in our post-Edward Snowden times, reminders of the mere extent of personal information housed and tilled in this and many other companies and governments facilities is chilling to most people. Banality can lead to the sense of defeat characteristic of Bethos. Gerard's animations, I think, pre present today's dominant landscapes. Thank you. We have, I think that's 10 minutes for 10 minutes or so for um, questions, comments, observations. Oh, and I think, uh, as before, if you can wait for the microphone, that Sarah is charging heroically towards the front. Um, yes, down here. Um, if you could introduce yourself again. And uh, yes, yeah. um, Rosie Ibbotson. Um, thank you for the fantastic panel. Um, something that was in your papers that um, really resonated with something um, that I've been thinking about a lot in my work is this question of, um, is a landscape image always and by definition of something disappeared? Um, and I'm thinking about time, um, like we heard about, um, and thinking about landscapes in the round as more than human, and also this myth of ecological stability, um, which is another potential problem of the idea of the Anthropocene. Does it kind of assume that, you know, prior to human intervention, there was a sort of stability going on mm. there. So I just was wondering if you could comment on this idea of like landscape and is it automatically something disappeared when it's in an image? Thanks. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think it's necessarily something automatic, something disappeared, but there certainly seems to be um, uh, there are certain forms of imagery which kind of work with that um, uh, sense of, of things, you know, passing. Um, I mean, the Anthropocene is quite a sort of, you know, complicated and possibly confused idea in relation to this because it's about, um, you know, it's about transformation. Um, it's about uh, things, you know, changing and disappearing. Yet it's also trying to project forward as well. So it's um, it's a it's one of those strange concepts which is, you know, simultaneously backward and forward looking, mm -hmm. and you know but also homing in on, on the present and labelling the present. Uh, I'm not sure it does um, presuppose kind of a, a prior state of unchangingness, I think, because, you know, the, the Holocene is not something that's... It's a period of relative climatic stability would be seen, but it's not, it's not labelled as a, uh, you know, stasis, then change. That's not the point of it, I think. Um, and then also, you know, for some commentators... Um, you know, there are some people who argue that the Anthropocene is the same as the Holocene because it's basically about the time from which the, hum the huma humanity had an impact on the environment, which means, you know, the shift from hunter-gathering to, you know, settled agriculture or whatever thousands of years ago. So there's a, I, I think one of, the, one of the things about the word is that it's, a, it's, a stra it's an interesting moment for the word at the moment because science has not officially designated it. You know, they are, the jury is out because the, it's a weird word because on the one hand it depends on a formal committee of the Stratigraphic Association in the Geological Society deciding that there's something which they know in thousands of years' time will be in the sediment. So that a future geologist, it's about future geologists being able to look back and define when it is. So it, in that sense, you know, they're, they're not... They're trying to find the, you know, the answer. Um, but, of course, the word has escaped. <laughs> the word has got out. <laughs> and the word is doing all sorts of other work. And I think it's a really interesting, you know, in, in supposedly in two years' time, 
you know, if the International Commission on, on Committee on Stratigraphy rules that the Anthropocene began in 1951, let's say, mm. um, is everyone then going to regroup and say, oh, yes, it's nice so, you know, the Queen was crowned just inside the Anthropocene. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> but in 1945, it wasn't the Anthropocene. Well, that's not going to happen. So it's a, it's a very kind of interesting moment, probably equivalent in some ways to, you know, a word like evolution 150 years ago, mm. you know, which kind of alters, the, might alter the sense of things, but which, of course, if anyone's ever read anything about the history of evolutionary theory knows, <laughs> escapes the control of anyone who was trying to measure it. And that, I think that's why I, I think the term is, I'm not wholly convinced necessarily by the term. You know, I can see lots of, all of the criticisms which you alluded to and that you alluded to, mm -hmm. absolutely are, are pertinent, but it seems that it's a word which isn't going to go away and therefore it needs to be thought about. That's the, that's the point. Yeah, just really briefly, it's an interesting question. I think that a lot of contemporary ecological art, um, yes, does have that lament. I mean, that can be built in, not necessarily positing something unchanging in the past. But uh, just for example, I've been looking at a lot of contemporary artists who are working on glaciation and the um, you know, recession of glaciers in mm -hmm. many different parts of the world. And while you know, the photographic reference to um, you know, formerly buried, now exposed land, it's a bit like the island um, discovered, mm -hmm. um, of course, it can make you think back to what used to be there. But I think like the term Anthropocene in the way David's been describing it, it really is both retrospective and prospective. So it's, it's kind of a future lament uh, as well as a reflection on the past, I think, frequently. Mm. I think Joy had a hand up. Thank you. Um, Joyce Lehman. Um, Martin, just I wanted to just thank you to, for reminding us about the uh, uh, Landscape and Eschatology Conference and just remembering that at that time you said, um, people said to you today um, that you don't do landscape. I remember when we were doing that conference, somebody said to me, you don't do painting. Um, and uh, that uh, I think one of the, the challenges and the really interesting thing about the image we have here is that a lot of the discussion around uh, land art has been very much connected to sculpture. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess this is a question um, for Mark, really. You talk very much about how that periodization that's defined land art, landscape, um, eco-art, has been one of the um, uh, barriers to making these connections. But I just wondered whether you thought also the ones of media had as well. And today it's been really fascinating that we've so effortlessly moved between yeah. photography, film, sculpture, performance, without that being an issue. And I just wondered whether that had come up in your research, looking at the yeah. history of land yeah, art. Yeah, de definitely. And um, thanks for that, because I've quite purposefully been putting, you know, outrageous <laughs> comparisons such as the current one uh, uh, up. Um, partly to make that point, uh, I, I suppose the counterbalancing to that very fluid exchange amongst um, materials that we've been seeing and demonstrating in our own talks is, and you would know this of course, when you talk with a lot of artists, um, they're very specific about their media and rightly so. Uh, whether they're still willing to call it sculpture, whether they're, you know, whatever they're happening to call it. And I think perhaps, I mean, Simon Starling, since we were just looking at his works, I don't know what he calls himself, multimedia, whatever he works in, all kinds of different media, but I think he's quite specific about photography uh, in those pieces. It wouldn't make any sense in one ton two um, if you didn't have the actual mineral deposit. So while I do want there to be the kind of comparison both chronologically and across media, um, I think probably starting with myself, I should be a little bit careful about just blithely going back and forth. And that's perhaps one place where, um, I mean, you can do almost anything uh, in the you know, frame of, of a, an image presentation. But when you're thinking of curating and actually in, installing works, then that materiality becomes much clearer. And we have to remember that that's, that's a source, too. Mm -hmm. 
Patrick. Just, uh, uh, oh, sorry. But just, uh, just to follow up on that, I think one of the um, things also that strikes me is the the way in which you know images which are categorised as art um, also speak with images which aren't categorised as art, mm. and um, you know that's the case. You know, as the work that was alluded to at the start of today um, about you know work about the 18th century produced in the 1970s or 1980s or whenever was being evoked. You know, that the point about that work was to make art images speak alongside scientific images and you know map images and military images and so on. And the same thing happens today. So I think the you know, questions about climate change. Um, you know, there are also a lot of other people producing images of climate change, which are compelling and iconic, and they are scientists. Right. And um, you know, there is interesting work done about the role of things like graphs in becoming, you know, iconic images which travel and you know capture a message and become you know obligatory reference points for debate. So, you know, just as in work on the 18th century, it's about different categories of image speaking to one another. Um, that's clearly what's going on, you know, today. I mean, Cape Farewell was mentioned earlier, and that's obviously one version of art and science talking to each other. Um, but, you know, they're talking to each other anyway in, mm. in the world <laughs> as, as these images circulate. So, and there's some very interesting studies done on, you know, people have looked at how particular graphs have, you know, been the focus mm. for arguments. So. Yeah, I think we can make those connections as well. Microphone is with um, Sarah. Yeah, Sarah Monks. Um, I wanted to ask uh, both speakers really a, qu a question about what happens to the view um, as a, um, I suppose, kind of central feature or expectation of landscape imagery within a critically engaged kind of anthropocenic um, uh, analysis. Uh, I mean, partly I'm prompted by to think about Google views and the yeah. view as something that yeah. we're looking at on the screen here. Mm -hmm. um, David's paper and the caravan seemed, I mean, uh, suddenly those images made me very yeah. aware of the caravan as a machine for making, uh, for, for views, you know. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And yeah, I just wondered, I mean, you know, h how yeah. we uh, might c kind of re engage or, or think about the view now? I mean, what are the kind of valences of it? Mm. Um, I mean, yes, I suppose one of the, I mean, one of the reasons for using this term Anthropocene, it's, it's partly, it's a bit of word play, you know, as is the word Anthropocene. And so, you know, that's, um, but it's, it's partly just kind of to, you know, return us to that point about the view. And, um, you know, the scenic, which isn't just purely about the scenic isn't just a visual thing, it's about experience, it's about sound, it's about, you know, all sorts of other kinds of um, phenomena. Um, but I think, you know, there are, it's, it's striking with a, you know, with phenomena like climate change or the Anthropocene, which of course have increasingly seem to become interchangeable terms, um, that there are certain, you know, literal perspectives which get taken there. And so, you know, the image of, um, you know, a group of scientists and artists sailing on a small ship up a large fjord, you know, <laughs> it's kind of not insignificant in producing a view of a particular kind. And that taps into long histories of the sublime, it taps into all sorts of things about nature, and, you know, so all of that kind of stuff is conjured up there. And, you know, so the view from a cliff top, you know, obviously again, you know, works like that. And, and I suppose what happens is that, you know, Again, as you would see from all work on landscape, um, you know, the view, you know, even if the view stays the same as it were, it alters it because, you know, the, the perspective, you know, the world that you are looking in is altering and therefore the view starts to take on other meanings. And so that's why I think, you know, so many people might suddenly start, you know, pu pu publishing views from cliffs and views of the sea. And that now is overtaken by these other narratives and it can't be those other narratives can't be escaped even if you want to. So the view becomes still very important and whose view it is and all the rest of it. That's a really interesting way to think about how the view is something that human beings have is also rejected uh, in any sort of post-humanist turn or object-oriented mm -hmm. ontology, w materialism. Uh, and I'm thinking back to the Pierre Rieg uh, installation, which I assume others here uh, visited um, in 2012, 
where you're walking a, into this, it's not really a garden, it's a kind of uh, refuse site. Uh, and it became evident not only after, and you kind of read what Wieg thinks about it, but when you're there, that this isn't about the human view at all. Uh, it isn't even that you're excluded from it. It's that it's operating on a different level of um, ontology. So while I'm sure that there are new conventions to be learned in terms of, uh, well, we've already seen that today, the sort of Google centering on where you are, mapping, all of that, I think there's also a strong attempt, a rather ironic attempt on the part of contemporary artists to move away from the anthropocentric view uh, completely and imagine all of us in, you know, outside of that. I'll make it 5.40, and whilst this can and will run on, both over drinks at the Mellon Centre now and tomorrow, um, I'm going to call things to a close now and uh, give us the opportunity to thank again uh, Mark and David for their um, fantastic